Excellent. Welcome, everyone. Bonjour. Um, it's great to have all of you on the line uh, today. So I'm pretty excited about today's webinar uh, because, in my view, it's a very great example of how advocacy, um, it, it's actually a great example of um, how uh, we can witness the power of advocacy and how we can actually lead to change. Um, so we're, I'm really excited to be sitting here next to Chris, um, who uh, will be doing most of the talking and I will be doing the, the listening. <laughs> um, so before we start, um, I, I'll, I'll just introduce myself really quickly. I'm Melissa Dubay. Dubay. I work at Results Canada. I'm the public engagement organizer. And I'm uh, very happy to be here today with Chris, who uh, kindly offered to do this very exciting webinar. So some housekeeping before we begin. Um, so we're hoping or we're estimating that the webinar will be about 45 minutes uh, in length, but we did book an hour just in case to be extra safe. Um, it is being recorded, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because there are a number of people who were interested in the webinar who were unfortunately unable to join us um, today at this time. Um, most of you should be on mute, and we kindly ask you to remain on mute as uh, Chris will be um, speaking so that we ensure that everyone has the best audio experience as possible. There will, of course, be an opportunity towards the end for any questions, so that's the time where you will be able to ask any burning, difficult... <laughs> yeah, not difficult, easy, any burning, easy question. <laughs> uh, to Chris. And um, there's also the chat box, so please feel free to use that at any time. And of course, if the sound or anything is not clear, please stop us uh, before we continue. Um, and you can raise your hand at any point. Those are the housekeeping. And then just to be sure, in case some of you are, are not as familiar with Results Canada, um, so who is Results Canada? We're a movement of passionate citizens committed to raising our voices for a world without poverty. And we are a national advocacy, uh, a national grassroots advocacy organization that has been doing amazing work for more than 32 years now. And what we do is we, we believe in empowering engaged citizens to use their voices to influence the political will to end poverty in the global south. So what does that mean? Is it means that we combine the voices of our grassroots advocates with strategic advocacy efforts to leverage millions of dollars for programs and improved policies that give the world's poorest people the health, education, and opportunity they need to thrive. So today, um, we'll hear, as I've mentioned, from Chris Dendis, um, who will talk about how Canada made history uh, by putting front and center young women at the G7. Over to you, Chris, I'm just Great. going to do that. That's me. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, all you beautiful people for taking some time out of your busy afternoon to sort of join us and think through what the last, um, what this journey has been to get to Charlevoix and what I think will get there uh, was a significant investment and a significant commitment for the world's, uh, for many of the world's uh, people living in poverty, particularly young people. Uh, thanks to Melissa. Um, Melissa and I haven't been here for 32 years, by the way. <laughs> It's been a little less than that, but it's been an inspiring time nonetheless. So I'm the executive director here, as Melissa has said, for those of you who are not um, part of our grassroots family, but all our family here. So thank you and welcome for joining this call. Uh, here's, here's what we're going to do. This is going to be a bit of a walkthrough um, the last year or so, lining up the dominoes and showing how we got from, you know, the first germination and thinking about the opportunity that um, this past G7 could represent for the world. Um, and how we finally achieved what I think was a significant um, piece of impact um, in, a, in, a, in Charlevoix last week. And so it really is kind of a bit of an advocacy discussion, not a totally in-depth policy discussion, but if we want to bring it there, then we can in the Q&A, and we can see how, how we do on that. Um, so just to, so why don't we just dig in? So just to begin with, uh, you know, going back over a year, actually, and, and perhaps some of you on the call were involved in that from a policy frame, but going back over a year, uh, what results does is recognize and look to the horizon and think about where the significant opportunities for impact in the world are. Where are the significant moments? Where are the significant spaces where we can make a difference as grassroots volunteers, as staff, as committed citizens, working with partners to try to change the world? 
And as we looked ahead, because results had had some experience working in 2010 on the, on the Muskoka Initiative, but just in general, I think advocates know that when a country hosts a G7, <laughs> um, there is significant opportunity to not only get and push for development to be on the G7 agenda, but also I think what Muskoka taught us and just in general, what we know as advocates is that with Canada playing host, that also presented a significant opportunity for Canada to lead mm -hmm. and to push Canada to lead. And in this particular instance, to push Canada to put a bit of their money where their mouth was in terms of, um, you know, the new Liberal government's commitment to what um, its position and its leadership in the world could be. And so, uh, you know, again, over a year ago, well over a year in advance of Charleroi, a group of civil society organizations under the umbrella of CCIC, the Canadian um, Council for International Cooperation, came together and brought a variety of organizations together to sort of recognize this was an opportunity and to think through what that opportunity could represent. And so there were a number of different stakeholders involved, there was a number of discussions, there was a number of sort of you know, good thinking and thoughts that went into what could be a set of concrete uh, areas or issues that civil society in Canada could really push and lead on, you know, along with civil society around the world, of course. But this is where it kind of germinated and began. Eventually, after, you know, narrowing it down to a number of different options, and there were still other options that were being floated around by, um, by coalition, um, you know, into the 11th hour and some progress made on a variety of different issues. But there was a real sort of, I think, consensus that there was a number of organizations or at least a critical mass that rallied around the notion that this could be the year, this could be an opportunity to really advance education. Education as priority, education as a means of empowerment, education for, um, you know, some of the people who live in poverty to ensure that they were empowered and that um, filled some of the gaps that had existed globally. And there was a number of reasons why we kind of hit on education, and maybe I'll just elaborate a little bit more. Primarily, it's about the need. It's about a recognition that, for a variety of reasons, um, education could be an entry point to tremendous impact. And I'll say a couple of things. First of all, one of the things that has struck me and that I've repeated a number of times, but certainly the coalition coalesced around, was this idea that, you know, at the present time, at this current time in history, there are more young people under 30 than ever before at any other time. There's this critical demographic or this massive demographic bulge of young people around the world, um, many of whom live in um, low-income countries or in fragile contexts, who um, are being uh, left behind. In 2016, there's 65.5 million forcibly displaced people in the world, and over half of those were under 18 years old. And so as we're thinking about this kind of critical momentum of young people, and thinking that there's two ways to really look at that, that demographic bulge, some leaders and some folks around the world might think of that as, a, as, a, as a somewhere to place fear, or something to be feared, because you know, without opportunity or economic opportunity, what would these young people do? You know, these are kids that could be, you know, um, convinced to join militia or, you know, these are, these are the most marginalized kids. We chose to look at this as an opportunity for hope and solution. These are children who with investment can not only change their lives, but change the world. And that is kind of the road that we rang in on. We decided to kind of focus on educating uh, particularly young women who are young girls who are two and a half times less likely to actually access education in conflict and crisis zones and refugee camps, in part because those displaced young people, those displaced people in modern times are now often in those camps or in those situations, not for a year, not for two years, but you know, 20 years, a whole generation of young people being lost. And in those critical kind of areas that slip between uh, humanitarian and development aid, schools are often the first to close and the last to reopen. So for all of those reasons, we kind of came to the notion that there is a real potential for impact by prioritizing education, by prioritizing education for boys and girls, but looking at education with a gender lens to really focus on removing that barrier that girls face and educating uh, and, and prioritizing that sort of in crisis. So educating girls in emergencies became sort of our mantra and what we decided to prioritize and focus on. There was also a sense that 
there was a real political opportunity given that, um, you know, Canada had professed to want to lead in the gender space, that we had a prime minister who was the minister of youth, um, and that when you bridge those two things and when you bridge the idea of making the feminist international assistance policy real in a tangible way, all of these things from impact to political imperatives came together, plus a massive financing gap came together to say this was the area of interest, focus, and potential for impact that we decided to prioritize. So a number of uh, organizations, kind of a smaller group of organizations, um, and this is a picture of a number of us who are involved in those, the CEOs, but also working staff of Save the Children, uh, Plan, World Vision, Right to Play, UNICEF, Result, CCIC was involved with this, came together and you know really developed the materials, the stock and trade materials that were needed to really make the case. Um, we added a at the all important from result standpoint, frankly, to make a declaration more than words to make it tangible, um, we added the call to action related to resourcing. So we did our homework and we looked at where sort of previous um, pledges and analysis and costing had been done. And we came up with what we thought was a realistic figure or something that we could achieve of 1.3 billion from the G7 with a 500 million ask of Canada. And we had hoped that that 500 million would be new and additional to the um, ODA baseline. So we met, in this picture, we're meeting with Katie Telford, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Um, we met with a number of different Chiefs of Staff from the Minister's Office, Bebo's Office, to Status of Women, parliamentarians, a number of different folks, government decision makers, all building the case for a declaration at the G7 to educate girls in emergencies and crisis with a $1.3 billion G7 act to reach 3.7 million more children each year living in these fragile contexts. In addition to this, <laughs> while, you know, as a staff and as, you know, as organizations, we coalesced and worked in community and, and, and um, coalition, uh, um, and also I should say in global coalitions as well, at the same time as we were doing this, our partners from World Vision and Plan particularly were leading a global G7 task force on education that was bringing in civil society from countries and other G7 nations who were also doing what we were doing, but in their countries. But this picture is of a, a brilliant group of folks who are our results grassroots volunteers. We had a national conference in May. May, May, <laughs> May Only a month and a little yeah. bit ago, where I saw many of you. And um, But even before that, months and months before that, our results volunteers have been advocating in support of uh, more investment from Canada in education in the lead up to something called the Global Partnership for Education Replenishment. But building on that dynamic, we're also starting to push for, you know, uh, an additional investment at G7. So this picture is a group of amazing results volunteers and other partners and friends from really around the world and across Canada who came together for a lobby day on Parliament Hill, an advocacy day on Parliament Hill, along with members of you know, there's a couple of members from the Prime Minister's Youth Advisory Council and some other tremendous young young people who joined us. And we had, you know, dozens of meetings with parliamentarians that day with, you know, a couple of key asks, but the fundamental one being reinforcing this, um, this call to action for educating girls in emergencies. We met with parliamentarians. We also, as a group, I think there were about 30 of us, went to the Prime Minister's office and met with um, you know, senior policy advisors there to really push and show that there was momentum behind this. And while we were doing this, you know, our coalition partners were doing many of the same things. And I, I wanted to highlight this because really truly why I love results <laughs> is this notion of grassroots to global. That you know, there's smart and astute sort of research and development and thinking and strategy that goes in as a staff that we love to kind of spend our time thinking about. But we have this amazing grassroots space that feeds into that strategy, makes it stronger every single time, and then makes it active and 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 um, meaningful and real and actually makes the difference. And at the same time, we work at a global level with partners. On this particular one, I was, for example, just a little insider gossip organizing calls between our Prime Minister's office and staff there with results executive directors from the UK, from the US, and, and myself kind of thinking through also what the global opportunities were since we were all joining and coalescing around action on education globally. Um, so all of this was percolating and um, 
you know, gaining, I think, some momentum and some interest. I think at one point the Prime Minister actually, in the wake of all of this, at some point, I think during the W7 meeting that was in Ottawa, made a verbal commitment to a G7 initiative that would focus on educating girls in emergencies with no money, with no real strong commitment attached. So that's why we kept finding. But before we get back to the G7 writ large, I wanted to add in, um, I think what this was sold as, so, but it was another domino along the way that was that proved to be critically, uh, a critical domino in the buildup to, I think, what was a significant investment in girls' education at the G7. And this took place at the development minister's meeting that, that um, was in Whistler, again, just a few weeks ago. This has been a whirlwind <laughs> of a month um, in Whistler, uh, Canada. Um, we are this coalition that I said that we belong to. This this coalition of NGOs that I referenced earlier was approached by the minister's office uh, about bringing together, um, doing something different at this year's development minister's meeting, and that doing something different involved bringing together young women from countries around the world to actually have real face time during the official agenda of the development minister's meeting, not a side meeting, not in the hallways not in the coffee shop down the way, but actually at the table with those powerful brokers who um, control the development, the development agencies of the G7 control, I think, eight out of every ten, 80, 80 cents out of every dollar that goes to development. So this is a powerful force to kind of have the opportunity to influence. So these amazing young women that you see on this picture, uh, the we are Agenda 2030, um, Anastasia from Jamaica, uh, Isata from Mali, uh, Siti from South Africa, Hannah from Wikwimakong uh, Unceded Indian Reserve in Northern Ontario, um, Ermine from Benin, and Ren from Lebanon were the group of young women that didn't know each other before they got to Whistler, but came together to um, bring their voices to that to that power. Um, that, that decision-making table. I was fortunate to be invited by the coalition to moderate the discussion with these young women um, at the development minister's table. And we worked with these girls, we worked with these young women, I should say, um, you know, in a couple of days leading up to the meeting, just to get them to coalesce and formulate their own thoughts about what they wanted to say. I need to tell you though, there was no script. These young women have such amazing power and voice that <laughs> they were the script. They developed their own script. We were only there to power each other up, and they certainly gave me power sitting around the table and across from them. They are incredible um, young women who, um, you can see them all there with the minister and myself, but incredible young women who not only collectively bonded together, but who were there to represent not only themselves and their communities, but young women like them from around the world with the objective ultimately of really pushing the necessity of prioritizing adolescent girls as part of a development, a global development agenda. So you can see them all sitting at the table. You can see Isata with the minister here in this picture, but really they each spoke for five minutes. They were powerful voices speaking about the power of education, issues that they care about, violence against young women, equal opportunity, economic opportunity. There was a myriad of issues that they, they shared. I will tell you that it was slated to be an hour. We went and grabbed lunch in the hallway, came back in, and it went for the it went over lunch as well. And later, many of the development um, minister ministerial officials came up to me and came up to them and said what a difference they had made in terms of really making the discussion and turning the discussion that typically happens at these tables and making it real. They were incredibly powerful, and ultimately, you know, along with a little bit of fun, the result was. Uh, the Whistler Declaration on Unlocking the Power of Adolescent Girls for Sustainable Development. And it's available online, and I'd encourage you to kind of look at it at the Charlotte West site. But it really is, uh, you know, multifaceted. But the primary thing that it kind of gets across, it talks about a number of different issues that affect adolescent girls that need to be committed to working on by the development ministers. But what it really is, is a... Um, uh, a call for an integrated model, that there is one girl and that she needs a variety of interventions or priorities or focus to kind of um, support her and to support her empowerment. And so that declaration was passed. They were literally still jotting down notes on it after the girls spoke. I, I saw them doing it, and I think they made it more powerful by being there. 
The other thing I'll just share as a side note was that while we were there, the, these young women also got a chance to meet with the Gender Advisory Council members who were advising the G7 who also submitted recommendations. And it was truly an open and, and, and sharing of wisdom, not only from the, from the elders to the young women, but from the young women to the elders. And it was, it was wonderful to be there and be present for that. And it spoke to the power of women, but it spoke to the power of multi-generations to kind of come together to affect change. In that picture, you can see Winnie Bayamiyama, sorry to say her name wrong, from Oxfam International. Uh, Katya Iverson was there from Women Deliver, and Roberta Jameson, an indigenous, indigenous advocate from Canada. And, you know, we also had a lot of fun. So those are, those are the mm -hmm. girls and also some of us who were supporting them. In addition to this, and, and I know that we're, I'm going long, but we'll just, uh, I'm going no, you're, oh, I'm yeah. okay. <laughs> in addition to this, Again, that was a domino that articulated the need because what was really relevant about these young girls coming together, well, there was a lot of relevant things, but one thing that really stood out to me, and certainly we made the case after the fact, was that the commonality of these young women, whether they were from Benin or Jamaica or Lebanon or Wiklamakong, was that they had access to education. That they had access to education and that empowered them to speak passionately not only about the power of education but also you could just see that that brought them together in a way that they were equipped to really light up that room and then you know i would say light up the world which was very powerful and here's another young woman um, who also in her own way has lit up the world and has become a friend of results canada fatuma omar ismail um, you know is a young woman who is an advocate for education um, her family fled Somalia in civil war when, when she was very young, and she spent her young life and her adolescence in, a, in one of the largest refugee camps in Kenya. And now she is studying at a university in Canada, uh, U of T, University of Toronto, um, and has become an advocate. She actually joined us on our lobby day um, on Parliament Hill with results and came to our national conference and, <laughs> and was dynamic and powerful. And in fact, at the, at the prime ministerial meeting that we had, the advisor whispered over to me and said, we have to do this for Fatuma. So again, the power of voice, not only statistics, but the power of agency and the power of grassroots and the power of citizens to make a difference. And Fatuma certainly made a difference. So Fatuma started a petition alongside some uh, organizational coalition partners who supported her. And the petition, um, I think the objective was at first 50,000 signatures, and then it was 100,000 signatures, and then it was 150. <laughs> and before they closed it, it had gotten to 167,000. 264 signatures around the world, and that's a pretty powerful um, um, so piece of support for education. On the heels of all of these dominoes I've lined up with you, the meetings that we had inside and outside, and this petition, this group of CEOs that you see on the, on the, on the picture now, this is us at a press conference a couple of weeks ago um, on Parliament Hill um, to present Fatuma's petition, but also to reinforce and reiterate the call to action, reinforce and reiterate the call for investment, which is absolutely critical to impact, particularly from a results standpoint, making that declaration that we were calling for real. And so at this press conference, um, that was what that was about. And it, you know, it generated a fair um, deal of um, media, but also I should say that you know, the power of media to influence and affect change is astutely harnessed by a variety of organizations. For results, it's harnessed by hundreds of letters up to the editor that our volunteers write every every um, every year. And on this campaign in particular, I think it was it was it, they let up you for those that are on the call, you know, let things up by really publishing. And those were shared with decision makers. They saw that, and it helped to kind of create the political well and the universal political discourse. But again, as you say, back to the theme continue to help line up the dominoes that we needed, both inside and outside, grassroots and global, that made a difference, I think, in terms of, um, in terms of getting to where we needed to get to. So this brings us to, um, you know, Charlevoix and um, what happened in, you know, Quebec last week. Now, I know there were a number of headlines <laughs> that we're all very, very aware of uh, in terms of our friend to the south, well, not our friend, the guy to the south, making some comments about our prime minister and also about the process. And I would say even up to uh, over a year ago when we first began meeting with the Sherpa for the G7, there was a feeling um, and a sense that geez, get, just getting through this G7 would probably be a significant win, frankly. 
there was a little bit of that. The bar was extremely low um, coming out of Italy in the last G7 just because of who the players were around the table. Um, and we all know, I don't have to tell you, we all know that some of that certainly, um, you know, some of those shenanigans certainly happen. But the thing that I feel really uh, proud of and the thing that I think we need to remember is that something significant did happen. And that significant thing was, you know, the Charlevoix Declaration, holding it up, on quality education for girls, adolescent, or for girls, adolescent girls, and women in developing countries. Uh, we had, you know, uh, as, a, as organizations come together and develop sort of some markers of what success would look like for this declaration. And um, really, I'd, I'd encourage you to go and read it. Most of those markers are there. It's a, I think it's a powerful um, new policy piece that commits the G7 to, again, focusing on an area, and remember why we did this in the first place, where there is tremendous opportunity for impact, where there is tremendous need, that chooses hope over fear, and that also articulates a new space between humanitarian and development that, that action and, and um, impact can be achieved. And so that declaration did get announced at this G7, and that's something that we can all be proud of and happy with. The other thing that I wanted to say is that um, beyond our wildest imagination, we didn't just manage to succeed in leveraging 1.3 billion globally. The final tally was 3.8 billion globally um, for this initiative for educating girls in emergencies, girls and boys, or education generally. And um, new donors, while well, donors that traditionally don't step up to the plate, not necessarily G7, but of that amount um, for, for longtime grassroots volunteers, one thing to note is that the World Bank has committed $2 billion over the next five years to education, which is, you know, ensuring that the World Bank actually prioritizes, you know, those most in need and the issues that we prioritize and care about education, health and others is, I think, a significant win. And that was due to a lot of hard work. Um, you know, the UK came in with a significant investment of new resources for education. Um, Germany came in with a significant investment. Japan came in with an investment. I think there were some other sort of Scandinavian countries that came through with an investment. The US did not make an investment, but we're not going to let them rain on our parade because 3.8 billion is nothing to sneeze at. But this is a significant win and one that we should all be proud of. Canada made a, an investment of 400 million, a little shy of what our you know, Canadian target was, but still, I think a significant investment over three years. And we have been told verbally by a number of sources in advance of and even during and the day of, of getting some real time calls from outside the room in Charlevoix, 50% of that, those resources, and we're gonna follow up on this, are said to be new to the ODA envelope. So I'm going to repeat that. So 400 million over three years. Those 400 million are not repackaged. They are new to education. They are not re-announced. They are out of the two billion that was announced as new to the ODA envelope in the budget. But of that 400 million, 200 million is an addition to that two billion. So there was a bit of a double win. Not only resources for education, but resources to expand the ODA envelope. Again, need some follow-up because these were verbal commitments. You know, we need to make sure that people do more than speak truth, that they actually make it happen. Um, but in addition to that, just to say what it really what really matters is the impact. Um, those investments are inputs. The impact when we did the calculations in real time, and I think these need to be kind of you know shown to be true, but eight and a half million more girls and boys living in the most fragile context will receive an education each year that would not have had we not all worked together to kind of make this a reality. I'll just add that in addition to this, you know, results have been very involved in global health campaigns for many years. We also led the working group on global health for the G7 globally. And I'm happy to say that also, you know, on the margins of the education aspect, that there was a tremendous amount of work by results and coalition partners to ensure that there was some global health wins in the communique as well. And we saw on the final release of the communique signed by six plus one <laughs> is a re recommitment to polio eradication, 
scaled up efforts to end tuberculosis, and a successful 2019 global fund replenishment, which was not in very in the last days, but, but I think that some last minute advocacy managed to kind of get that in because the 2019 global fund replenishment will be happening next fall. And then, you know, just to kind of, you know, wrap, I, this, is a, this is a piece that appeared as a, as a full page Globe and Mail ad along with some of the coalition partners that we worked with, articulating the, the thanks to everyday Canadians who signed that petition calling on G7 leaders to support this declaration to educate and empower girls in crisis, thanking the Prime Minister, and committing to keep on the fight. So I wanted to share that as well. Um, you know, I think this speaks for itself. I think that this is a win, and I think that, you know, we released a statement that, about applauding global leaders for this and the Prime Minister, recognizing that we have to ensure follow-up always to make sure that the money is real, genuine, above baseline in, in many instances, and that it will, it will absolutely go to where it needs to go to have impact. But I should say that results, I want to say this out loud, results also applaud citizen advocates across Canada and across the globe who raise their voices in support of a G7 initiative that prioritizes hope, progress, and impact. Money. And that's... That's, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. All right. So now it's time for questions or comments. Um, so what I will try to do is, I believe um, you are able to unmute yourself, but I will go ahead as well and unmute everyone and um, so that you can speak freely. And there's also, of course, the chat box that you can use. Don't be shy. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, my name is Angela Quinlan. I'm a member of the Grandmothers Advocacy Network. Um, I'm quite new to results, but I did come to your national conference, so I do recognize some of your faces. Um, congratulations on your successful campaign. Education is one of the human rights issues for uh, quality learning for, for all ages um, in the Grandmother's Advocacy Network. As you know, we focus mainly on Sub-Saharan Africa, but um, we recognize it's an issue in many other places as well. Um, my question pertains to health. I'm more interested in the health side of thing, and I, I'm just wondering, I know at the G7 there, there weren't planned any um, specific sessions on, on health, and I'm just wondering if in your experience when you were there, if you heard anything mentioned about the TB campaign. Sure, Angela, thank you for that. It's, um, should we just, we'll just do one after another? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, this is casual, this is friends and family. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the first G7 in a long time, like I don't even know of one where there wasn't a, a separate ministerial meeting that prioritized, that focused on health. I mean, we did our best, we tried, but it was, you know, that, that was a bit disheartening. Having said that, having been at the development minister's meeting, and I, I really do encourage you to look at the um, adolescent girls declaration about empowering okay. adolescent girls because health is throughout. It, you know, it's, it's advocating for an integrated model of what young young girls would need to kind of really thrive, survive, and be empowered to change the world and kick ass. <laughs> but um, it, it does talk about nutrition and, and wash and sanitation. It, it talks about a, a, a variety of issues related to health. The communicate itself does include, and, and um, as I mentioned, does specifically reference polio. It does specifically reference tuberculosis. It does not reference the high-level meeting on TV that is going to be taking place in, no. at the sidelines of UNGA. We did not manage to get that in, but we did, and again, even a few, this is inside, you know, this is inside the house <laughs> conversation, but even a few days before the G7, we learned that the, the global fund was not referenced. Uh, no, sorry. So, t so it does talk about ending, eradicating TB. So that worked and that's specifically referenced. It also calls for a full replenishment of the global fund. Even a few days in advance, the global fund was not there. TB was and polio was, but the global fund replenishment was not there. And everybody felt that it was extremely committed. We reached out to our French partners and civil society in France 
you never know what actually turns the tide. But our civil society partners in France who are having meetings with, with their Sherpa right up into the lead up of the G7, because we recognize that Canada could not redline at that point any of the, the, the communique sort of language or declaratory, you know, provisions because it had gone out to the world. But because France is hosting the, the global fund replenishment next year, we thought Macron or whatever their Sherpa team would probably have the best chance of actually getting it inserted. Right. We kind of left that to them to do. And then when we saw the communique, it was there. So it was a bit of like kind of strategy oh, to see that happen. So we've got global financial and we've got that commitment to uh, NTD and eradicate TB, which is good, at least it's specifically referenced, but, um, but no commitment to the high level meeting, not in the communique. But, you know, I think this was a challenging year to get any communique out. So what's okay. there is pretty good. Thanks very much. Thanks. Chich um, Kristen or Ch Chitra? Chitra? Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi. Um, I was just wondering uh, how the 1.3 billion turned into 3.8 billion. Was there some extra advocacy that happened? And also, is all of the 3.8 billion uh, going to be targeted to um, girls and boys in crisis situations? or is some of it for education in general? Great question, Chitra. Um, you know, I think it was, I'm gonna say that it was the Prime Minister's office and staff, senior staff in the Prime Minister's office who really, you know, took to the phones to kind of ensure that at least the 1.3 billion would be met. And in doing so, I know, I know from, from conversations that, Justin Trudeau really, you know, in his leadership calls with with leaders, with prime minister, like with prime ministers and presidents, really pushed this initiative and like, you know, put his cards on the table to try to get them to invest. And so part of it was, I think, that high level kind of political will. Part of it was civil society working. But I'm I tell you, a big chunk of that, those resources were are from the World Bank. And um, the way that came about was, uh, you know, in part. I think that there was there was calls with leadership of the World Bank and as results affiliates and again the UK and Canada and the US we had calls to support officials in those calls to give them some background and support on that but you know the World Bank came through and you know we need to kind of track and ensure that this is you know this is a meaningful or significant investment but nevertheless on the surface it looks like it's something to kind of build on or at least um, be, be happy with um, to your second point about so a little bit of magic I don't know political <laughs> will it was the right issue at the right time the World Bank stepped in with a big wad of cash otherwise it would have been 1.8 I mean France to be honest with you when you ask me are all of the resources going to educating girls in emergencies Canada's absolutely I think the UK is absolutely a few others we have to double check and see I think France's pledge frankly if, I don't think they made a pledge, but I think that they had committed to the Global Partnership for Education, and a portion of GPE's resources does is said to be directed to to this issue. Um, but I think we have to do the analysis and see and make sure. I mean, it's not the end of the world if it goes to the right things, but but I think a critical proportion of it will go to this issue, and certainly the policy parameters um, are a positive uh, step to kind of bridge the silos. Excellent. It's, it's an Thank amazing. You. So it's really, it's really great news coming out of the G7. Great. Thank you so much. And then we have Anita who asked a question in the chat box. Her question is, when can we see this money go to work and what are the mechanics? Mechanics? Mechanics. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I felt like I was saying that word wrong. <laughs> what are the mechanics <laughs> of the distribution? <laughs> You know, as usual, you guys ask all the right questions. Um, I was actually asked this by a Global Mail reporter at that press conference. Talk about, you know, my little inner applause thing for those of you who know me. <laughs> uh, the, res the response, the, the thing about um, the mechanics is that we actually purposefully did not specifically articulate for the G7 writ large the, the entry point to investment, trying to kind of create some latitude um, to ensure that the resources were large. Having said that, um, there, the uh, Education Cannot Wait initiative, which is sort of supported by UNICEF and others, is one where we had, we certainly as results had articulated we a good place to put investment, and I have a feeling that some of Canada's um, commitment will flow through that mechanism. Um, in terms of, but, but again, it's something to follow up on. This is all still fresh. There was not a specificity of where the investments would flow, and I haven't actually, frankly, even had time 
to do an analysis of this, to look at Great Britain's commitment and where they've said it will go. I apologize. I mean, we had articulated that as long as the impact and the, and the impact numbers were sufficient. But yeah, education cannot wait. Again, GPE is as long as supporting the issue of girls prioritizing the, the moving, removing the barriers to girls' education in these fragile contexts, which they do do some work on, um, were the kind of key uh, platforms. And the rest is a little bit of stay tuned. <laughs> I mean, advocacy doesn't end when we get the win. As results, folks have been around a long time now. I mean, we get the announcement and we celebrate, and we should celebrate. And we probably don't celebrate enough. We move mm -hmm. on to the next thing. But it is the follow up, and it's making sure that, um, you know, pledges are adhered to. It's making sure that Canada lives up to this 400 million commitment because that's within our power. It's following up with the World Bank when we go to the international conference in, in July, which some of us will be at, asking, you know, asking hard questions of folks at the bank in terms of where the investments will flow. It's the follow-up, follow-up, follow-up. And it, on, on, the, on the Canada investment particularly, Anita, I think the thing that's most important to me is literally writing a letter today or tomorrow or making some calls to figure out and to ensure that the 200 million that has was said to be above the ODA envelope is actually truly going to be above the ODA envelope so that they didn't just say that, but we can actually ensure that they do it. Thank you. And then we have another question in the chat box from Kristen. What do you think we can learn from the success of this campaign as we mobilize towards Women Deliver in June 2019? Kristen, is that Kristen Ostling? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Our good friend and a brilliant advocate in and of herself in her, in her own right. Uh, you know, Kristen, I think this is, I think this is, what can we, what can we learn from the success of this campaign as we mobilize towards Women Deliver? I feel like almost turning the question over to you and asking you because I bet you have some thoughts. I mean, Women Deliver, there's, there was two landmark moments for Canadian advocates on the calendar in the 12 month span. The G7, which happened a couple of weeks ago because Canada was hosting and there was an opportunity for us to lead on a legacy initiative and get significant Canadian investment to that initiative. And in about a year down the road, the Women Deliver Conference that, that Kristen is alluding to, which will take place in Vancouver in June of 2019. It's going to be, it happens every three years. This is the first time it's been in Canada. We expect probably at least 6,000 people. They could probably tell us exactly the number or that they're hoping for. but. You know, this is, uh, the world is coming to Canada at the biggest conference on women and girls, well-being, health, and empowerment in, uh, on the planet. And it's going to be in Canada just before an election <laughs> and the next big moment where the world comes to Canada. I think that it's either a gift to this government to have it here and not allow them to make, or not, not push for them to make any commitments, or it's a significant opportunity pre-election to get them to up the ante on ODA and some of the other issues that you know, those of us can debate and, and, and speak to, but that we really care about in terms of getting a significant investment. It's a domino, you know, Kristen. I think that there are other ones that, are, that I can see on the map leading up to Women Deliver between now and then. There is a nutrition event that we know that is on the horizon in November. There is, um, yeah, um, there's, a, there's a variety of events that we can kind of continue to push and advocate for Canada to make the FIAP real and then realize that push at a, at a, with some other significant investments that women deliver in, in, in June of 2019. It's not a great answer to your question, but I think we need to kind of rally pretty soon and really put our heads together around and you know canvas our grassroots volunteers as well and get them engaged on what that global moment, another global moment being hosted by Canada means in terms of using that as leverage. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions? I'm looking at all of you if you want to raise your hand or unmute yourself or you can use the chat box as well. Can I share, an, since if there's no questions, I can yeah. share another little insider yeah. since we're all friends. And, um, you know, the one thing I keep no matter what Women Deliver is going to be or the one thing I want to, I keep harping on because I think sometimes as you get older, when, some, when you hear something and it resonates and it, and it stays with you and certainly meeting these young women in Whistler helped to reinforce that for me, is that, is that, that kernel of truth, that reality, that was the basis behind which we even started thinking about educating, you know, girls and boys in emergencies, which is this, you know, I come back to this demographic youth bulge. This, this massive number of young people more at any time in history 
who are many of whom are living in dire ch challenging contexts. And you know, again, and that 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 idea that th that that massive bulge of young people, you know, that this is either an opportunity for them to, to to support them so that they are empowered to change the world. And it's not just about them. It's not about just like improving one person's nutrition or access to education. It's about empowering them so that they are powered up to actually fix this world mm -hmm. <laughs> that we that we see lots of hope. And I'm I'm a, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna on this. You know, there's lots of hope and progress, but to kind of really change the world and transform it. You know, for seven, seven generations ahead, as Hannah mm -hmm. would have said to me from the Wisdom Macomb um, Reserve. And the little insider thing is that, you know, it was a reminder to me, you know, you learn lessons no matter how long you've been doing this kind of work. But when we sat in the meeting with um, Katie Telford, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, a pretty influential person, when they were still deciding what the, what, if there was going to be an initiative or what it would be. And, you know, we're sitting as CEOs and others around the table with, with, um, Ms. Telford, who's a brilliant young woman. And um, I had the opportunity to reinforce and reiterate that, that story, this, this opportunity, this opportunity for Canada to choose hope and to like really prioritize investing in these young people and again, for what they can do for the world. But the thing that it kind of invoked to me was the power of storytelling because like literally in the meeting, it tweaked to me that maybe the reason it resonated for me was about a week before the Parkland students, you know, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. had taken to the streets. This was about, you know, a couple months ago, right? And do you remember how we were all so powered up by seeing these young people on the mm -hmm. heel of crisis, you know, step up and just be so powerful and use their voice and use their steps and use their power to like really be so effective and meaningful. And I think that anybody that is progressive or cares about the world in the way that I trusted that she did would kind of feel that too. And what twigged for me was the storytelling of just like those kids in the U.S. that we were all empowered by and across Canada, by the way, I think my son also they like, kind of marched in their schoolyard for this. Um, there are, you know, hundreds of millions of more young people like that all over the world in some of the most challenging places in some of the worst places, let's face it. And how many of them are, you know, like these young people in the US, all they need to be is lit up through the power of education, health, nutrition, the kinds of things that awareness of their rights and their capacity to kind of do the same thing, to be as powerful as those kids in the US. And it was just, I just wanted to share it because it was one of those moments where I felt really connected to the issue in a really profound way. And it wasn't about stats and it wasn't about policy wins and it wasn't about why you should do this. It was the recognition of our common humanity and what should motivate us and making that connection between what this really represents in terms of educating these young people, um, that opportunity for hope. Um, impact, empowerment, and like world affirming and world changing, you know, power. So I thought I would share that okay. without being asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. We actually uh, received uh, one more question okay. from Jeanette. Um, the question is, will the U.S. results groups and others continue to work towards gaining an investment in education from their government? Great question. <laughs> it, terrific question. I will say that <laughs> being on phone calls with our PMO and with like Joanne Carter and John Fawcett and others who you might know from the US if you've been down there, um, that were informing the global investment, we kind of knew, we kind of knew that the US was not going to invest in this specifically. But yes, the, the short answer is absolutely. We know that the global campaign for education that's based out of the US is, is absolutely going to continue to push. As they're pushing on many, many, many things in the US, it's I think a tough place to be. But you know, even more reason to kind of rally, advocate, and and, effect, and 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 try for change. So the short answer, Jeanette, is yes. <laughs> Should we go ahead and yes? All right. So yes. I think hey, you said yes. <laughs> so I think we will uh, move on. Just wrapping up uh, with a couple of last slides. Did you want to tell me to go for it? Go for it. Great. So of course, as uh, Chris said. Um, 
not only was this an opportunity to, uh, to, to understand and see how um, advocacy can really have a po is very powerful and can have an impact, but it was also an opportunity to celebrate even if it was for the past 45 minutes, really um, all of the amazing work that people have done uh, here in Canada um, together and as well with others from across the world. But um, you did say that we don't celebrate enough because now it's time to take action already. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, there's always something else. <laughs> so, um, most of you know um, that we have a monthly action, so I definitely encourage you to go and uh, be active this month. Um, it's about TB and how uh, the Canadian government takes lead at home, but what about abroad? If you are not um, familiar, familiar as much with how the month's action works, please feel free to reach out to me at grassroots at results. Uh, to get more details, I can definitely uh, help you understand what are the steps. And of course, something else linking us back to the G7 is don't forget to, sign, to thank the Prime Minister, the Ministers, your MPs, and anybody else that you think. And thank uh, them for the 200 million in new and additional OD <laughs> that is going towards the 400 million commitment. <laughs> yeah, so please take the time to do that. That's a great action that can be. Uh, that can be done this month as well as um, working on TV. And yeah, and Angela, I just wanted to say if you're still on the call from the grannies, I think, you know, Shelly or we'll reach out to the group too and just knowing um, knowing how much uh, you prioritize and focus on the sort of same issues, but particularly this one, because this is also about the HLM, getting your voices added to our, our um, actions this month would be fabulous. So we'll mm -hmm. reach out and ensure that we make those connections. Excellent. Last but not least, thank you. Thanks for being here uh, with us today. And thank you, Chris, for thank you, talking to us about this. It was very, very oh. empowering. Yes. We have one other plug since we have you all on the call. <laughs> our AGM, our annual general yeah. meeting, which is an hour-long teleconference, which will take place on June 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time, um, has a special guest, and that special guest is Stephen Lewis. Um, who, you know, as many of you know, was going to be the keynote at our conference but wasn't able to participate, but is, is wonderfully able to come and join our call for the first, you know, 20 minutes or so to kind of provide some, um, some share some remarks. So please, you know, feel free to join us. It's, it's you know, for members of grassroots uh, and uh, results, but it's open to everybody. It's just for the mm -hmm. official part of the agenda, you have to be a member to, um, you know, vote on things. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Well, oh, great. And if I can just add yeah. to that, if um, you need to register, um, so if uh, you do not happen to have the link to register, please feel free to just email me and I'll make sure that um, you are registered. So it's grassroots at results .ca. And thank you everyone for the great comments. It was uh, great to see many of you and great to see again, perhaps see some new face faces as well. So thank you. Merci. Merci. Bye. 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 Bye.